Hello everyone, this is Nairi from Low Carbon Fasting. Well, our guest needs very little introduction because you may be familiar with him, already has very big social media presence. So, but for those of you who haven't met him, don't know much about him, here's a brief introduction. So, he's an American medical doctor specialized in neurology, but he currently resides in Perth, Australia. Um, he's a former professional rugby player. Um, he's a researcher of optimal nutrition through diet, and he focuses on not only the things we should eat for, for optimal health, but also the things we shouldn't eat. Um, he uh, also runs a functional medicine clinic alongside his neurology work. Um, he, before graduating as a medical doctor, he's studied molecular and cellular biology and chemistry and he is an advocate of the carnivore diet. I think that's uh, in summary that just sums up our guest today. So Dr. Anthony Chapey, welcome to Low Carbon Fasting. Oh well thank you very much for having me, it's a pleasure. Dr. Chapey, I first, I mean you relatively new in this space uh, on social media and you grew big very mm -hmm. very quickly there's a reason behind it of course um people identified with your message hmm. i first came across, across one of your presentations on youtube um, you were on stage and you were doing this presentation and it was the title was plants are trying to kill you <laughs> my initial reaction was okay here's a new face i don't recognize him He's obviously seeking attention. I scrolled down because <laughs> <laughs> with a title like that, that was my first impression. The 50 year old me, that, that's the first thing I thought about. I scrolled down. A few days later, another presentation of yours came with the same title um, in my feed. And I thought, I'm going to watch this. And when I watched it, it all made sense. I understood why you chose such an att attention grabbing title because it is that plants are trying to kill you. I understood what you meant by it. And you were referring to the toxins and anti-nutrients in plant, which are causing us um, numerous, um, uh, which the numerous uh, sorts of health conditions, right? Yeah. So I've been a fan, fan of uh, fan of yours since. Actually, I don't miss a single live or anything. I don't usually comment, but I'm always there. Doctor yes. Chafee, let's start with a basic question. So, what is it in plant foods that's causing us ill health? Well, it's it's their nature, really. Their their nature is to be uh, poisonous. Unfortunately, well, fortunately for them, unfortunately for us, they are one of the oldest living organisms on the planet or a kingdom of, of organisms. They're one of the first that, that evolved on this planet, uh, the first to be created. And so then animals and insects came in and they started preying on them and eating them. And, and so uh, fungus and, and so on did as well. So in order to survive, the ones that survived had to have defensive means and, you know, they can't run away or fight back like an animal can. They're stationary. And so they need other sorts of defenses. So they might have spines or thick bark or a tree that grows up very tall. So terrestrial animals have a difficult time getting up to them. And, um, but, you know, there are a lot of animals and insects that can get to these things, can get past the spikes and the spines and the, and the thick bark and things like that. And so they need other defenses. And, and one of their main defenses is by actually being poisonous. And so they, they make a lot of defensive chemicals and toxins that can be directly harmful to animals and insects, or they can be indirectly harmful. So they don't necessarily kill you, but they can make you unwell, or they can disrupt your hormones. They can disrupt your digestion. They can make it so that you are not going to absorb various nutrients, you know, like phytic acid will bind to various minerals and nutrients and in ways that our body can't break down. And some might say like, well, you know, the bacteria in our, in our colon can do that fine. Uh, if you have the right bacteria, however, we don't absorb those nutrients in our colon that we absorb them in our small intestine prior to the getting to the colon. So it doesn't matter if they break the bonds in our colon. We can't, we can't use them unless you want to eat your feces, which I would not advocate anyone to do. 
Uh, but that that was what you would have to do. That's what gorillas have to do because they don't get enough B12 from the food that they're eating. And it's the, their gut bacteria that makes B12, but they don't they can't absorb the B12 in the area where their gut bacteria is. And so they actually have to eat their feces in order to get B12. Again, not something that I would recommend people people do, but that's that's what they have to do. Um, there are many other things. You know, plants as uh, as the uh, professor from uh, in a botany from uh, Cambridge University said, uh, J Dr. John Parker said that um, plants are the great chemists of the world. They make about 1 million different chemicals. Most of them are defensive in orient, right? Um, they can be other, other sorts of mechanisms as well. Latex, we get latex gloves for surgical gloves, right? Um, that's actually a sap of certain plants that they use to be so tacky and sticky that when animals eat that plant, they release this latex and it actually glues their mouth shut. And so it's sort of an elegant way of stopping that animal from eating the plant because if you open their mouth, they can't go and eat that plant anymore. So it glues their mouth shut and they're stuck. Uh, unfortunately, most of the time the animal dies after this because their mouth is, is glued shut. They can't open it again. They're not eating ever again. So that's, a, that, that's usually a fatal uh, consequence of eating the wrong kind of plant if they don't have the ability to uh, to work around the latex. So there are a lot of these different different issues. We recognize this for literally thousands of years. We know that there, most plants are inedible, right? You get lost in the woods and you run out of food. You can't just eat any random plant. Most of them will make you very, very sick or even kill you. And so you have to know which ones are safe. Safe in the short term. That doesn't mean that they don't have any toxins though. It just means that they don't have ones that will kill you that day. But smoking doesn't kill you that day. Alcoholism doesn't kill you that day. It builds up over time and over decades and slowly breaks down and wears down your body and uh, and can cause harm over time. Now, is, or is eating plants as bad as smoking cigarettes? Well, of the plants that we eat, most of them probably wouldn't be. Most plants on earth will kill you if you eat them. So in fact, most plants are worse than the tobacco plant, which is again a plant. And... Um, you know, and if you eat a tobacco plant, you're not going to do well. That's going to make you very, very sick. Um, and that's because you have the, these defensive chemicals that are designed to make you very sick or even kill you. So that's how plants defend themselves. We used to recognize this as the diseases of the West, diseases of civilization. Now they're just getting older. That's just what it is. And now it's more prevalent and more common in every every country on earth, even developing nations. And like, you know, uh, you know, such as India and or Africa, there's rising rates of diabetes and heart disease, autoimmune issues, and all the other things that we used to, that we get here in the Western world. These used to be extraordinarily uncommon, even in the Western civilizations. We eat roughly the same amount of meat now that we did in the early 1800s. And throughout the 1800s, we ate basically sort of this U-shaped curve through that the 1800s, around 1900, and then it sort of peaks back up again, um, and, or sort of goes down around 1920, 23, and then it starts on the rise again. Throughout the entirety of the 1800s, heart disease was, was an unknown thing. I think there were a few case reports around the world uh, in the late 1800s of, of heart disease. The great medical... Um, uh, examiner and uh, educator, first professor of medicine at Johns Hopkins University, uh, Sir William Osler, um, is uh, ha has said in his you know decades of of uh, practice, he wrote in some of his textbooks that he saw I think something like six cases of angina, so you know chest pain uh, from cardiac related chest pain, and maybe they were cardiac you know related or not, but that was you know that was the symptom that that they had, and you know really no heart attacks. Right, I think it was like the first case of of uh, autopsy proven myocardial infarction, death from myocardial infarction, heart attack in America was in the early 1900s. I think 1905 or 1908, and it was largely dismissed and ignored for about a decade in America because there's like, oh, that's not a real thing. You know, that doesn't happen. You know, we just don't see that. And so after about a decade, when this started be this started happening more and more, and people started seeing it, they're like, oh, wait, hey, okay, well maybe. Maybe there is something there. And then a decade after that, you know, when we get into the, getting into the 1930s in America, uh, heart disease is the number one killer in America already. 
you know? So before that, it was unheard of. You know, someone who described it on autopsy was just like, this guy's a joke. He's not a, he's not a credible uh, doctor. This is a, this is a laugh. And uh, in 20 years, it was the most, you know, uh, most dangerous thing that we, we had uh, available to us. Right. So that, that means that something changed, that we're doing something to ourselves. Well, it wasn't meat because we were eating more meat throughout, throughout the 1800s than we were when, when that's when, when heart disease started to arise, right. And we started eating more meat after that, but in that whole period where we were eating more meat than we were at that point, there was no heart disease, none. Right. So we were eating more heart, more meat in the early 1800s than we were for most of the 19th century and no heart disease, absolutely no heart disease. So there's something else going on. And, you know, during this time we started making more processed foods, started using more plant-based foods and people started getting more and more sick. We started introducing refined sugar, refined carbs, and seed oils, industrial, industrially processed and, and, and uh, made seed oils that were industrial lubricants. And they said, you know what, this is just like fat. We can just make it into Crisco and we can, we can sell it to people and that'll be great. It's so much cheaper. And so, you know, restaurants and uh, food production companies, they use that because it's a fraction of the cost of butter or lard. And so that started becoming, that started replacing animal fats and heart disease started going up and it perfectly tracks heart disease and uh, the rise in heart disease prevalence and, um, and seed oils perfectly track. So, but not meat and not, uh, and not animal fats or saturated fats. So these are, these are unrelated. So I think that it's, it's predominantly from eating things that, that we're not designed to eat. All animals have an evolution or a biologically designed diet, something they are designed to eat. Food is very species specific. Animals in nature, they eat very, very specific things. Humans in nature eat very specific things, generally, unless they're limited by what they can eat. When they're able to hunt, when they're able to go after big game, that's what humans hunt. And that's what the fossil record was very clear on. Uh, we've been hunting mammoths for a million years. And, um, and then it wasn't until the megafauna died off that, you know, around the last ice age that people started eating more, doing more of the gathering part of hunter gatherers before that it was really just hunters. And still in a lot of places, it was still just hunters. And that's why you see areas that had cultivation, had, um, you know, agriculture, they actually got sick right away. There's, there's a sharp, you know, decline in, in the health of humanity uh, just after the agricultural revolution. So on, in the fossil record, you see humans were five inches taller, larger brain, 11% larger brains, better teeth, better jaws, no cavities. They didn't have any crooked teeth, um, you know, better developed bone structure, longer femurs, all these things, you know, ev you know, no evidence of poor wound healing. All that stuff came directly after the agricultural revolution. These are all signs of malnutrition and potentially, you know, toxins from from the food we're eating but there's that sharp demarcation at the agricultural revolution and so you know you see this clear distinct difference between when we were largely eating meat and when we were incorporating a lot more plants and then when we traveled around the world when europeans went around the world and and started you know all the different colonies they noticed that the non-western countries the, the people there weren't getting the same diseases that they were getting in england and in france and in in Switzerland and Sweden and so on. And so they called these the diseases of the West. And so it was like Western people got these diseases, the diseases of civilization. But as the people in these other countries or, or continents like North and South America or Sub-Saharan Africa or Australia started eating the food of the West, they started getting the diseases of the West. And in fact, they were more genetically susceptible to those those diseases when eating a western diet than than other people were and of course that's because they hadn't had 10,000 years 8,000 years of exposure to these plant toxins and the ability to sort of gear up some some genetic changes and so they're much more sensitive there was a study in in uh, 1992 looking at the Inu the Canadian Inuit um, and they found that they were, as a population, not all of them lived traditionally in the, in the way that their ancestors did, which is just eating a lot of fatty meat. But, you know, some were living in cities. They start smoking on average at eight years old. So, you know, high, high heart disease risk right there. And 
and yet they had very low heart disease rates uh, in respect to uh, the rest of Canada. And they said, okay, well, they must have genetic protections against this. And so they looked at five different genetic markers to say you know, that, that either predispose you or protect you from heart disease. And they found that no, actually the Inuit were actually had all the bad ones, had all the genetic risk factors for, for developing heart disease. And so, and you know, out of the five, the majority of people had at least four of them. And so, you know, this was, they're actually genetically prone to getting heart disease and yet they're not getting heart disease at the rate that others are if they're eating their traditional diet, which is just meat. And, um, you know, and, and, and they're smoking <laughs> since they're eight years old. Right. So even then, you know, they don't, they'll get heart disease. The, the cancer rates in Inuit were near zero in the areas that they, um, that they only eat meat and they're not, you know, if they're in, in the cities and they're eating garbage that, that everyone else eats, so yeah, they'll, they'll get, they'll get cancer actually worse. Right. But the cancer rates in the Inuit population has, has successively gone up decade after decade as they've been more incorporated into Western society and started eating more Western foods, drinking Western drinks, smoking Western cigarettes. And that has gone up and up and up. But, you know, in the populations that they, they don't do that, they're extraordinarily low rates of cancer, heart disease, and, and all the rest. So I think that is a direct result of eating a species inappropriate diet and a result of these different plant toxins that are harming us and and damaging our biology and our physiology. And that's manifesting in ways that that we don't know how to explain. So we gave it a name like lupus or myasthenia gravis or heart disease or diabetes or cancer. And we just went, oh, okay, there's this thing that's happening, not recognizing that this is actually a consequence of eating something that is harmful to us, that is toxic to us. You know, there was, there was a time that the the Romans had lead pipes they, and people were just getting sick. They had no idea what was going on. And after a while, they were like, actually, there's something something going on with these lead pipes. That That's that's causing us to get sick. And so now people can recognize those symptoms. But, you know, if you look at this as, as a new fresh illness, and, and there's the precedence for this, a new fresh illness, you're just like, wow, there's just these biological changes and you see these, these end organ damage and all these sorts of things, you think, wow, there's a disease process here. Something's going on here. Okay, let's get some medication that that stops your these this liver damage in this way, stops this neurological damage in, in this way or whatever, and you can mitigate the effects and have you die slowly over 40 years. But unless you recognize that this is actually caused by lead exposure and lead poisoning, well, then, then you're never going to get rid of the problem. You're not going to get rid of the root cause, right? So the only thing you, the only thing that you can do to safely get away from lead poisoning is, is get away from lead. You know, you can take medication to help you get there, but you you have to stop the exposure from lead. And in fact, in, ja in Japan, they had this epidemic. I think it was in like the fifties, fifties and sixties. And, uh, and there were all these people dying and they didn't know what was going on. And they're trying to figure out what was going on for about a decade. They couldn't figure it out. Then they assigned... Uh, someone who was a, a microbiologist, you know, very, very uh, well-regarded uh, professor. And, you know, to a kid with a hammer, the world is a, is a nail, right? And so he was looking, he started looking for organisms and he was just like, and he found this little bacteria. He's like, okay, well, this is what it is. Let's try and cure this thing. And they spent another 10 years trying to cure this. And then, it, so it was after 20 years that they finally figured out, oh, this is actually, uh, you know, industrial waste going into the water supply and that's getting into the fish and kids are eating the fish and then they're getting sick from like heavy metal and, and, uh, and pollution, right? So it took 20 years. They were trying to cure a disease, but it wasn't a disease, it was exposure. And so that's what we're living in now. We're in our 1950s and 60s Japan. We're in our ancient Rome with lead pipes. We just don't realize it yet. So we're getting poisoned by the things that we're eating. We're getting poisoned by the plant toxins and not getting the nutrients that we need from the meat and the fat from the meat. And so we're getting illnesses and diseases that used to not exist. And now they're 90% of what we treat in modern medicine. That was brilliant. Um, <laughs> and we've only just started. So I'm pleased actually you mentioned some of the conditions that people suffer from, but they don't put, you know, two and two together. For example, the lupus is one you mentioned. And mm. my husband suffered lupus mm. years and years, and he refused medication. 
And without anti-inflammatory medication or pain painkillers, it can be horrible at times. But he's an athlete. He does weightlifting. So, um, so he did something good. And then we switched to carnivore. And his symptoms are 90% better. There are days when oh, something, really? it could be stress trigger, triggers it, tri mm -hmm. triggers uh, or flares up his symptoms, but he's 90% better um, on, a, on a carnivore yeah. diet. So, yeah, fantastic. so that's yet another story. And, you know, if you follow Dr. Chafee, you'll, you'll read, I love the comments under your videos because people just open up and they share their personal experiences. So we're not just talking about a single anecdote somewhere in the world. We're talking about hundreds and thousands of people reporting back um, uh, that they've improved their health conditions on a carnivore diet. Um, I was on Dr. Sean Baker's uh, podcast just mm -hmm. last week, and I shared oh, how I improved my type 1 diabetes management. Great. On a carnivore. Not a pure carnivore diet, but meat-based diet. Um, and so, uh, I mean, you've just got to give it a go and see how you feel, and you will feel better. Let's talk about the digestive problems. I don't know a single person, be it in my family or, you know, among friends who doesn't suffer some form of digestive issue. It could be the acidity in the stomach, or it could be the bloating. It could be the gaseousness. It could be uh, pains, abdominal pains. It could be Crohn's. It could be something really more mm. serious. No one really thinks that that could perhaps be caused by by species inappropriate food, by a large amount of vegetables we're eating, which we're not designed to do. What are your thoughts on those? Yeah, well, I think that that that's exactly right. That especially with our digestion, I mean, this is this is where our food goes, and so if you're if you're having indigestion, you're having problems and pain throughout your digestive tract. It's, it's most likely that you're putting something in your digestive tract that, that shouldn't be there in the first place. And so you're doing something that's disrupting that. And there are, are a lot of ways that, that plants can do that. And, you know, we term a gluten in gluten that uh, causes problems for people with celiac, but it causes problems for everyone else as well. Um, it's uh, gluten is a, is a lectin. Lectins are a class of defense chemical in plants or some, some lectins that are in meat as well, but they don't seem to cause a problem. Uh, for us, and uh, but the ones in plants do, and uh, gluten is is one of these, and they can bind to different carbohydrate receptors. So you know, you have different sorts of proteins and uh, and carbohydrates like on the surface of your cells. This can bind to them, damage them, and cause problems. And one of the problems that it can cause is it can cause what's called leaky gut, which is causes damages to the the tight junctions in your gut lining. So you have you have cells that are that make up the wall of your intestine, just like your skin. And so that's barrier protection because your, your elementary tract, your digestive tract really is the outside world. That's a separation between your body and, and the things that you're eating or the things that you, you put in your body. So your body's still like, well, we got to be careful about this, about what comes in and what doesn't. And one of the ways it does that is because those cells are stuck together with these tight junctions. And so when that damages, then those cells are sort of flapping loose and, and, and particles and molecules and even bacteria can sneak through those gaps and get into your body and your bloodstream when they really have no business there and your body would normally keep them out. And so that can cause a lot of problems and that, that can allow other lectins uh, to get into your body. These are foreign objects. The bacteria obviously are foreign in relation to your body. And so your body attacks them and makes antibodies towards them. And people that are genetically susceptible uh, seem to be able to develop autoimmunity. So the body attacks these, these molecules and makes antibodies. And then, but these antibodies go all, all throughout the body. And so there's something called a process called molecular mimicry, where, where some of the antigens on your cells may be similar enough to the lectin or whatever your body's attacking that it can sort of have a bit of cross reactivity with your, own, your with your own cell, sort of stick there and your body attacks that. Normally that's, that's not possible. You know, your, your immune system, every immune cell goes through a stage of maturity of maturation where they're introduced to every antigen in your body. 
And if they respond even weakly to any of these, they get killed. So they don't ever make it out uh, into the system. So it's actually quite rare, but it, it can happen. You can get this, this cross reactivity. And uh, when you have that, you, you get, you obviously get this autoimmune response and your body can attack your own body, but it used to be thought that you got sensitized in some way and then your body kept attacking your own body, right? I don't think that that's the case though, because when you remove these lectins, when you remove these things from your diet, when you reduce your inflammation, that those antibodies go away. We can actually track those. You can actually track the antibodies for certain autoimmune issues like Hashimoto's, for instance, or Graves' disease. And, and we see this in clinic, in clinical practice, or I do anyway, and other people who, who follow the, these sort of tenants do as well. I, I have dozens of patients with Hashimoto's and a few with Graves going on a carnivore diet and eliminating out everything that doesn't belong in their body. Uh, you, we actually see their antibodies coming down, 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 down without any medications, no medications. And, uh, and yet they improve their thyroid function improves and their, and their antibodies go down, which is fantastic. So that's one way that, that these things can disrupt your, your gut and, and with Crohn's as well. I mean, Jesus, like, you know, you, you ask somebody with Crohn's, what fiber does to them. It's not a pretty picture. You ask someone with IBS, what fiber does to them. It's not a pretty picture. There was actually uh, a study, you know, the only interventional trials with fiber, only interventional trials with fiber, with fiber actually showed that fiber made things worse, made IBS uh, and IBD worse. So irritable, irritable bowel syndrome and inflammatory bowel disease, IBS and IBD, they both get worse with, uh, with more fiber on clinical human trials, right? The only, the only trials or, or only studies and papers that say, oh, fiber is good for you and confers a benefit are epidemiological studies where they asked people what they ate and they said, oh, how much fiber or what are you eating or whatever? And they found, well, people that ate more fibrous, you know, fruits and vegetables, whole fruits and vegetables, they, they did better overall in their health than people who didn't eat as much fiber. Okay. Well, who's not eating fiber? I'm not eating fiber. You know, I'm only eating meat. But I mean, I make up, I mean, I mean, how many of us are, are there out there? It's like me and the Maasai and the Inuit, you know? And so, um, you know, it's not, it's not that many people. So in the grand scheme of things, in the general population, who isn't eating, car, who isn't eating um, fiber? It's people that are eating highly processed, ultra processed foods like McDonald's and Pizza Hut and all these sorts of things. Um, you know, not to, not to, you know, single anyone out, but like th those are the types of things, right? And that's because you can't put fiber in processed foods because they, because you have to freeze these things and ship them all over the world and uh, they don't freeze well. Fiber doesn't freeze well. It makes it all mushy and, and weird. So, you know, you can't, you can't have fiber in those sorts of things. So really what they're comparing is they're comparing people that are eating ultra processed foods and people that are eating whole foods. Well, I'm not surprised that the people eating whole foods are doing better than the ultra processed garbage foods. And they say, well, these are people eating meat. Well, they consider pizza meat because they can have meat toppings. Well, that's meat. Well, there are other things in there too. And then they consider, you know, McDonald's, you know, uh, meal meat because there are meat patties, but that's the, the vast minority of the ingredients in a McDonald's meal. You have a couple of meat patties, you have way more bun, you have way more vegetables and tomatoes and sugary sauces. You have a whole thing of, of uh, potatoes, deep fried and trans fats, for decades and now vegetable oils, you know, industrial seed oils, which are absolutely toxic, uh, massive omega-6 uh, ratio, hugely uh, uh, inflammatory and oxidative to your body. And, uh, and then a massive sugary drink, which isn't great or diet, which honestly is, is either just as bad or possibly worse. And so, you know, you can't just say, oh, that's meat. This person is eating less McDonald's. That means they're eating less meat. That means, and that, and that's better. So there, therefore meat meat's bad. And it's just like, that's stupid. You're stupid. Like, I'm just sorry. I, I just know I have no tolerance for people that, that push that agenda anymore because it is just ridiculous. And so when you actually look at the interventional trials with fiber, where they said, okay, here's more fiber, here's less fiber. Here's the same fiber. What's the difference? They found that people that ate more fiber, their IBS got worse. People who ate the same, same. People who reduced it got better. People who eliminated fiber eliminated all symptoms. Small trial is about 70 patients. 
but it's the only one that exists and it only showed that. And there was one, uh, and that's for IBS. There was one for IBD, for Crohn's disease that looked at, I think again, around 70 patients. And the intervention was uh, that they removed carbohydrates and fiber. So it was a ketogenic diet with which removed fiber. And uh, many of these people, and this was without medications. And so they were able to keep these people in remission from their Crohn's disease without medication for up to 51 months, right? So that's over four years without medications just by eliminating out carbs and fiber. And contrasted that with a control group that didn't stay, didn't stay in remission or stayed in remission on average zero months, right? So that wasn't a very good <laughs> alternative, right? So they needed medications, whereas you just get rid of fiber and you largely reduce or and carbohydrates. Obviously, we don't know uh, how much each one is contributory in that study, but you know, you eliminate those things, you largely eliminate a lot of the things that are causing a lot of harm and, and what comes with carbs, gluten. And so, you know, you're getting rid of the gluten, you're getting rid of things that can cause leaky gut, you're getting rid of the exposure to your body of these lectins and bacteria that your body can cross react with and cause uh, Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. And there are a number of other things, you know, that plants can do. They have protease inhibitors in uh, wheat, soy, and many other, other plants that block protease, which is an enzyme from your pancreas that breaks down proteins into their constituent amino acids so that you can absorb them. And so if you don't have enough protease or that protease is inactivated, then you can't, you can't absorb that. Well, then that doesn't get absorbed. That goes into your colon. And now you have dysbiosis because you have a whole bunch of weird uh, bacteria that are now eating that protein. And this is what people talk about. They putrefy this putrefaction of this protein. And this is harmful. And these bacteria that are promoted aren't very good. Okay, well, right. But if you don't eat this with plants, if fiber gets in the way, you can't break down uh, the, the proteins because the fiber makes physical tangles and barriers against uh, protease getting in there in the first place or lipase breaking down fat. And then the parts that are broken down, they can't get to the lumen of the gut because there's all this fiber and tangle and, and stuff in the way. It's not just liquid, right? And so that has to go into the colon. That has to be eliminated. And then you get these bacteria working on them. So they say, oh, look at all these bad things that happen with your gut bacteria if you eat meat. No, it's only if you eat meat with fiber and all these digestive disruptors, because otherwise you absorb nearly 100% of the meat that you eat and certainly the protein and the fat. And so that's never making it to your colon in the first place. And so you're never going to breed those bacteria at all. And, uh, and even if they were there, it doesn't matter because the protein's not there, the, you know, and, and the other, other nutrients are actually getting absorbed and the majority of the fat as well. So there, there are so many different ways this stuff can, can wreck your gut. And I mean, it's just the fiber itself can actually cause micro abrasions in your gut lining and causes increased mucus secretion and in, inflammatory responses. Now, how is that a good idea? And it causes malabsorption as well, because like, like I said, it, it physically gets in the way of things breaking down and being absorbed. And this was said to be a good thing. They don't look at it, it just blocks it. It makes it so you don't absorb as much. You just lose weight, eat fiber and you'll lose weight. And this is like, okay, yeah, it caused malnutrition. It worked in Auschwitz. Why wouldn't it work here? You know, and that's, not, that's not a good meal plan. That's not a good diet plan is, is uh, you know, self-induced starvation and malnutrition. Like that's, that's not healthy for anyone to do. And uh, as, you know, in the advent of that period where we told people to starve themselves and malnourish themselves and eat things that are harmful for them in order to trick their body into somehow not wanting to eat as much, you know, this is, this is where the rise in eating disorders and, and uh, mental health issues also had a massive uptick as well. I don't think those two things are uh, unrelated. So yeah, and then and there's a, a lot of other issues as well, just with like bioavailability of, of the nutrients in plants. That's another way that they protect themselves is by just not being as nutritious for animals to eat them. So it, an animal has to have evolved ways of breaking down those bonds or getting around those defenses in order to be able to extract those nutrients. And, and we're not very good at it because we haven't really evolved to eat these plants. We haven't been, you know, biologically designed to eat these plants. And so we can get extract some of these nutrients sometimes, but I mean, just, just think of fiber, fiber or strings of glucose. Well, we could use glucose, you know, when we make it, we don't need it, but we could use it. We can't use fiber, 
right? It's indigestible. No vertebrate animal can break down fiber, none, right? And so it's actually the bacteria in the guts of the cows and the horses and the, and the uh, gorillas that eat the fiber. The gorilla eats the, eats the plant, but it doesn't absorb that directly. It's the bacteria that eat and break down and absorb the, the glucose from the fiber. And as a byproduct, as a waste product, they produce short chain fatty acids, which are hundred percent saturated by the way. So the idea that saturated fat is bad is a bit comical when almost the entirety of the animal kingdom runs on saturated fat carnivores, because they eat animals with saturated fat and they get a, a large part of their, their, uh, calorie, uh, source from saturated fat, but also herbivores because they get, uh, they break down fiber, the bacteria eat the fiber and they produce saturated fat. So a gorilla that just eats green leaves gets around 70% of his calories from saturated fat. Cows get around, um, near, you know, nearly 80%, right. And then the bacteria die off and they absorb those as protein. So, you know, cows and horses and donkeys and all these other animals uh, that eat plants, fibrous plants, they eat that plant, but what they absorb is fat and protein. And then carnivores eat animals and they get fat and protein. We need fat and protein too. That is, that is what runs the animal kingdom is fat and protein, mostly fat. And we cannot really get that very well from plants. And what way are yeah. we from a gorilla, for example? Yeah, well, it's, it's just the, the nature of our digestive tract. We just don't have that functional ability to break down fiber and to extract these nutrients because we're not, we're not designed to do it. A gorilla can extract a lot of nutrients out of, out of the, the, the specific leaves that they eat because they do eat specific leaves. All animals eat very specific plants if they eat plants at all. There's 340,000 plants in the world. Koalas eat one. Pandas eat one cows, horses, grazing animals, they eat grass. That's it. And they eat specific grasses. The grass that a cow eats is different from the grass that a sheep eats. And so you can actually pasture them on the same paddock and they don't compete for resources, right? And if they do, if they eat each other's grass, they can actually get quite sick. And there are a lot of maladies in veterinary medicine that, you know, you know um, big head, limp neck, crazy cow syndrome, all of these things are, are names for illnesses and ailments that that animals get when they eat the wrong plant, right? And so vets have figured this out. We figured this out actually with people as well. You know, we knew that, that one, there was five different types of gout. It wasn't just the, these, um, uh, you know, uric acid stones. That's, that's what's called gout now. And the others are called pseudo gout. But up until, you know, a couple of decades ago, there were actually five causes of gouts. One of those was oxalates. Mm -hmm. Oxalates come from eating plants that have these oxalates. The, and, and, you know, you make a bit of them, you know, from the degradation of uh, collagen, but it's, it's, a, it's a, just a couple milligrams, right? We can deal with up to about 150 to 200 milligrams of oxalates a day. And so we would produce from the breakdown of our amino acids, a few milligrams of this. So it's well under the threshold of what we can, what we can tolerate and handle on a daily basis. But when you're eating spinach and half a cup has 600 milligrams, doesn't go too well. You know, because spinach is such a great thing. No, it's not. But it has so much calcium, has so much iron. Not for you, it doesn't. You know, that's not that's not bioavailable. We can't get that. And so, you know, there's so many oxalates, in which oxalates can can bind and strip out. You know, zinc, calcium, and magnesium, and all these other sorts of things. Um, that, that yeah, there's a lot of if you break it down and put it into you know a Gasparon, you know, uh, you know a, a, a machine that, that calculates out the different sort of atoms that are in uh, that that you know, matrix that has a lot of calcium in it. Sure. But when there was a study in the 1950s where they tried to try to bolster up people's calcium levels by giving them, um, spinach. And they actually found that their calcium levels went down, right? Because the calcium was bound up in ways that we couldn't break down and, and get access to. And the oxalates that came with the spinach actually bound our, our calcium and stripped it out of our system. 75% of kidney stones or calcium oxalate stones, right? And so this is, uh, you know, this is not a good thing. So we don't have that, you know, biolog biological ability. So we can argue, well, our guts look like a gorilla, or our guts look like a tarsier, which is a, you know, a fully carnivorous primate. And, um, or it looks like, a, it doesn't look, or it looks like more like a cow than a lion. It's like, okay, okay, come on. We are primates. 
we have the digestion and teeth and other sort of characteristics of a primate with our own individual biological idiosyncrasies, right? And one of those is, is, but the most important thing is function, right? We do not have the ability to break down fiber. That's not something that we can do on a large scale. I mean, you can, you can cultivate certain gut bacteria in, in your colon and some of it will get broken down into beta hydroxybutyrate, mm -hmm. right? And so, and people say, well, that's really good because that, that's your, your enterocytes, your gut lining really love that. And they really want that. That's really good for them. Okay. Well, that may be true. And so maybe if you're eating a bunch of plants and carbs and things like that, that, you know, maybe that provides a benefit also provides a benefit because it blocks the absorption of things that are bad for you. And so if you're eating good things like just meat, it's a bad thing because it blocks out things that you want. But if you're eating a whole bunch of nonsense and lectins and toxins, well, maybe some fiber is actually, you know, in the mix is, may not be a bad thing because it's actually stopping you from absorbing all of this stuff. Right. So, um, but at the same time, you know, one of the major ketone bodies uh, that we that we make when we're in ketosis is beta hydroxybutyrate, right? So, like, that's exactly what uh, we make anyway. You know, if we if we don't eat carbohydrates and we just eat a, a traditional uh, ancestrally appropriate diet, and so you you can make some of this stuff, some of this stuff, if you eat if you eat fiber, but it's, it's not it's not enough to run our body. You know, it's not enough to get enough. You know, nutrition out of out of that enough energy out of that it's a very small amount very very small amount because we just simply don't have the ability to break down fiber and that was the argument as to why we should eat fiber and it's the, still the argument why we should eat fiber because you can't break it down you can't absorb it you can't get nutrition from it and that's what you want you want in the 80s this was, this was thought to be the perfect diet food because you can't break it down you can't get nutrition you don't get calories from it oh great you can eat as much of it as you want and you get full and you feel full, but you're, you're actually getting nothing for it. And, and of course your brain is a lot smarter than that. Your body's a lot smarter than that. Your bodies are a lot smarter, smarter than we are. Um, because you, you have a lot of sensors in your stomach that actually track up directly to the brain and, um, and, and just say how many nutrients you're getting, how much protein you're getting, how much fat are you getting? And so, you know, you, you put through a lot of fiber and you get stretch receptors, put out leptin saying, Hey, we're full, but your brain is getting the signal is like, we have no nutrients here. There's nothing good for us here. You need to eat. And so people are starving and they're miserable and they're bloated because they have all this fiber just packed in their gut. I mean, look at, look at the gut of a gorilla. It's massive bloated thing because their intestines are so long and they have so much fiber packed in there. They have to eat 40 to 60 pounds of, of leaves a day. And, um, and they poop out eight pounds of meat a day or, or, of, uh, not meat, sorry, of leave, you know, of feces a day. They eat some of that too, to try to upcycle those nutrients, right? Because they have to get a second pass at digestion because it's so difficult to break down plants, right? It's very difficult to turn plant material and plant tissue into animal tissue, and, and most animals can't do that. 70% of animals that have ever existed were carnivores, are carnivores, right? And that's because it's a lot easier to eat an animal that has already done the hard work for us. We don't have that ability. We have a, in fact, we actually do have very carnivorous adaptations. We have a very, very uh, low pH, very acidic stomach acid that is, that is in keeping with other carnivores and, and even approaching that of carrion animals like vultures, right? So we're, we're actually very low or certainly in the carnivorous range of, uh, of stomach pH. It's around two, sometimes one and a half, one, 1. 1.5 to two cow was anywhere between four and six, right? So it's much different. This is a logarithmic scale, right? So that's a very, that's a big, big difference between two and, and four or two and six. And we have, we have a proportionately longer small intestine because that's where we need to get all of our nutrients absorbed. And our colon is actually relatively short. Other primates that eat uh, fibrous food, they have that the other way around. Their small intestine is small and their large intestine is much larger and much longer because they're called what's called hind gut digesters. And so they digest it and, and absorb this food in their, in their colon and in their cecum, which is the first part of the large intestine. And we know of it as an appendix, which is that big. 
But in a gorilla, it's like four feet long, wrapped around in coils and has a blind pouch at the end of it. And this is where fiber packs into and sits there and ferments and breaks down into short chain fatty acids and protein. And that's what the gorilla eats or that's what the gorilla absorbs. So we don't have that functionality. We don't have a long cecum because we don't, and we, you know, form equals function in biology. So we don't have that form. We don't have that function either. So maybe millions and millions of years ago, if you're, you know, a fan of evolution, uh, that, that, that was much longer and we were able to absorb this, but we haven't used it in millions and millions and millions of years. And so that's gone away because that that's not in keeping with survival. If you are, you know, putting energy into making this big, long, expensive fuel demanding organ, the digestive tract is very high fuel demand. You know, if you're, if you're doing that, then, you know, you're, you're going to waste resources and you're going to die. And so the people that survived, the ones that had smaller and smaller and smaller cecums, then you could dedicate more energy and resources to growing our brains, which take about like 50% of our resources of our energy requirements go to our brain. And uh, that's very, very out of proportion with other animals. And so, you know, we have, we had to shrink down our gut and take away, you know, energy demands from other areas so that we could put it up into our brain. And the only way you can do that is if you're eating extremely highly nutritious and nutrient dense, calorie dense food, which is what meat and fat is right. And it have to be, have to be very, very, very bioavailable and digestible and absorbable. And if you didn't have that, you, you can't absorb the nutrients, the requisite nutrients in, in such a way that, you know, we can really do well with such a short gut. And so that's, that's the main thing is that we just, we just don't have the form or function of an herbivorous animal. And so we cannot, you know, uh, survive on fiber, whereas a gorilla can, and people say, well, we'll look at a gorilla. So, so big and strong and they're getting enough protein. They're not getting protein from the plants. They're getting protein from the bacteria that are dying off. Right. And so we don't have those bacteria. We don't have that luxury. So, you know, we need to get that protein from the food we eat. Now you can get protein from plants and, you know, there's, there's a major, major straw man, which is just so ridiculous. I mean, the only, the only arguments that, that vegans are winning are the ones that they're having with no one, right? Because they're saying like, oh yeah, people say you can't get enough protein and blah, blah, blah. Like, no, no one has said that. No one has ever said that. <laughs> you know, Of course you can get protein from plants. There are proteins in plants. Now you're not going to get them in the right ratios, so it's more difficult. And they say, well, well, you know, if you take, you know, protein isolates and this that, and the other, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Listen to the words protein isolates, right? So someone has gone through and done a chemical uh, and industrial process to this and stripped those amino acids and made them bioavailable because there's a lot of uh, poorly bioavailable proteins and amino acids. So you strip that and you've broken these things down into their constituent amino acids and you've gotten rid of all the, you know, protease inhibitors, presumably, hopefully. And, um, you know, and then, and then you just have the amino acids derived from plant structures. No one is arguing that, you know, lysine from a plant is going to be as good as lysine from meat. I mean, that's, that's a ridiculous statement. No one has ever made that argument. Right. And so, you know, if you're getting equivalent amounts, yeah, fine. You, you can get it from plants. That's not what people are saying. That's not what people are talking about. They're saying that you can't get you know, uh, like the requisite nutrients, there's aren't like the vitamin, uh, the different vitamin complements like B12, you're not really going to get because it doesn't exist unless you want to eat your feces. You can do if you want. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and it comes with problems. It comes with other issues, right? It comes with, uh, you know, these defense chemicals that can cause harm. So people are saying, oh, look at a gorilla can get all this protein. Well, we can't, you know, like that's not the same thing. And they get it from, the bacteria that is that are breaking down and they're absorbing. And so we don't do that. We can't do that. You know, so we, it, it's harder for us. It's harder for us to get protein. You can do it. It is harder though. And it comes at a price. It comes at a consequence, you know? And so that's not free. And also you, we will not get uh, carnitine at all. Carnitine does not exist. This is carne, carnivore, car, you know, carnitine. It's carne, it's Latin for body, right? So this is, this comes from bodies. And so, you know, the food from bodies and the, you know, the protein from bodies, this doesn't come from plants. Right. And there are others as well. And these are considered non-essential amino acids, but that's not actually always the case. Only 75% of people make enough carnitine 
or, or even any carnitine. So there are 25% of people that don't make enough or don't make any at all. And so it's actually essential to them and they need that. And this is actually, uh, Texas A&M actually showed that this is, this is a cause for autism is people that aren't getting enough carnitine. They're going, their, their parents are putting them on a vegetarian diet or vegan diet when they're kids. They don't make enough carnitine. They're not getting it from their food. And so their brains don't develop properly because you have to have carnitine for proper neuronal development. And, you know, they're not getting it, unfortunately. And so their brains aren't developing properly and they're getting, they're getting what we are calling autism, which is really malnutrition and toxicities that are, de that are delaying the, or, or restricting the proper development of our brains. It's not a genetic issue. You know, because if they if they eat proper food and they don't eat things that are harming them and they eat things that they they need to develop, they won't they won't develop autism. In fact, people are reversing or at least improving significantly uh, the symptoms of autism and, and the developmental issues that go along with autism by putting people on a ketogenic diet and, and especially a carno keto carnivore diet where it's highly meat based. So the idea that that um, you know, gorillas can do it. So, so can we is, is a bit sophomoric and, um, you know, and, it, uh, actually, you know, requires a, a bit more looking. And if, if you, you scratch under the surface, you see that, that it's, it's not as, as simple as all oh, an ox eats grass and gorillas that we're not an ox and we're not gorillas. They have different digestions and digestive tract, and they have different nutritional demands as well. And so they can, they require different things than we do. And, and so they eat different things than we do as well. I'm pleased you talked quite in detail, actually, about the bioavailability of nutrients, because I was a vegetarian for 30 years. <laughs> mm, yeah. Before switching to meat eating um, on my birthday two years ago. Um, I noticed I didn't know much about nutrients, but I probably suffered I read up about it and I could self-diagnose myself with every digestive um, condition there is out there. I, I was experiencing every single symptom of those. Um, and of course I was protein deficient. It was clear because I was just fatigued. Mm. There were times I couldn't even like move about. I knew I had to start eating meat after 30 years. It wasn't an easy trans transition, but I did it. And um, uh, so it was clear that I wasn't absorbing the nutrients from um from uh, vegetables which i actually grew they were organic so mm -hmm. you know not pesticide laden uh, they were really grown in my own garden here in london <laughs> where we barely see the sun i put yeah. a lot of effort into growing my own organic vegetables but it was clear i would have them in large quantities but of course then the bloating for hours was unbearable mm -hmm. it would fill me up it would stretch my stomach the hunger wouldn't go away. I'd still be hungry. 30 minutes later, I'm still hungry. I can't possibly fit in anything else into my stomach, but I'm still hungry. Um, I knew I had to start eating meat. So, um, and I, I also knew that I wasn't absorbing the nutrients from these vegetables. You read up online, you look up online, you go, oh, so this contains this much potassium, magnesium. I wasn't absorbing any of those. I was deficient in everything you can possibly think of. And that's mm -hmm. why I transitioned to uh, sort of meat eating. You mentioned heart disease earlier on and how the rates of heart disease rose with people, probably part of it connected to the vegetarian movement, which started back in the 80s, right? So, um, so how about neurological diseases? Are they on the rise too? Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, my and and neurodevelopmental delays such as autism. I mean, that that's increased exponentially since the 1970s, right? And so, as these things were going up, as diabetes was going up, as autoimmune issues were going up, as Alzheimer's were going up, people just said, you know what? I, I bet you this was always happening. You know, I bet that that you know, 10 year olds were always getting type two diabetes, which they called adult onset diabetes at the time, and for. I don't know how many hundreds of years that this was that this was in existence. Um, and we've certainly known about it since at least the 1800s. I don't know exactly the first time that people spoke about it, but um, obviously juvenile diabetes, type one diabetes was known about before that, but type two diabetes used to be called adult onset diabetes. And it's because we only generally saw people in their, in their middle to late age and they were quite often alcoholics and it came with alcoholic fatty liver disease 
And then all of a sudden in the nineties, there were a bunch of 10 year olds. And I remember, I remember this on the news when I was a kid in the nineties, there were kids getting adult onset diabetes and they were getting alcoholic fatty liver disease, but they're not adults, they're kids. How can they get adult onset diabetes? And they're not alcoholics. They've never drank alcohol. How can they get alcoholic fatty liver disease? So instead of thinking about this for literally one second and saying, okay, well, something's going on here. Maybe something we're eating or doing is affecting us in this way. We just radically changed the way that we ate in, uh, after the 1977 USDA declaration that fat and cholesterol cause heart disease. So stop eating meat, stop eating fat, stop eating eggs, eat more fruits and vegetables and carbs and sugar and seed oils and all that sort of garbage, you know, unsaturated fats, polyunsaturated fat, where you get those, those are industrial seed oils, right. And full of omega sixes, which are toxic. You know, there's a very good book that just came out, um, by a friend of mine, Dr. Chris Kenobi, uh, who was an ophthalmologist for, you know, 20 plus years and, uh, has been doing re nutritional research for, for a decade, what a book called the ancestral diet revolution. And he, it was this, this whole book about how toxic seed oils are. And he backs it up with the data and the literature. Uh, he has over 1300 scientific references in this book. So this is, it's, it's, e it's easily readable, but it's, it's extraordinarily, you know, fact and evidence based, right? And so, you know, as we started eating a lot of, you know, tripled the amount of seed oils that we were eating since the, the 1970s to now, right? Uh, well, conveniently, the prevalence of heart disease tripled, obesity, I think it octupled something like that. Uh, diabetes, you know, increased uh, by a factor of six. And autoimmune diseases, autism, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, uh, dementia, all these sorts of things, they, they increased exponentially as well. They almost didn't exist before then, not in any great numbers as well. And so, you know, they, they looked at that and just said, well, I bet you that 10 year olds were always getting adult onset diabetes. So, you know, it, it's probably just, we didn't notice it. And we were just calling it type one, even though, uh, you know, juvenile diabetes is always insulin dependent you know, right from the get-go and uh, type two is absolutely not and generally isn't for decades. And uh, so no, no, that's not just being misdiagnosed. Um, and so they, they just renamed it. They renamed it type two diabetes and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease instead of trying to figure out, okay, what's causing the fatty liver disease as opposed to like, well, only, only heretofore, we only knew about alcoholic fatty liver disease. Okay, well, what else is causing fatty liver disease? So they didn't even look at it. They just renamed it and went back, put that in the too hard box and just move on. And uh, and all these other things increased as well. Autism increased and, and people you know, famously were worried about uh, vaccines and things like that because that's generally around the age that it presents. I'm not convinced on that, but you know, it's, it, it, it is such that you generally see kids get display these developmental delays at these times that they're getting vaccines because well, they're developing and quite often when they're weaning from breastfeeding, you start displaying these, these symptoms as well. Well, you're getting better nutrition when you're breastfeeding. Now you're going and eating a bunch of, you know, uh, you know, crackers and, and, and cookies and, you know, all sorts of, you know, just pureed vegetable slop, you know, with sugar and seed oils in it. You know, I mean, what do you expect? I mean, this isn't, this isn't very good. And, but we're being told it's good. It's baby food. And obviously Gerber knows what kids eat. This is what they do. No, that's what they, what they do is make money. And, uh, and that's what they want to do. And that's what they care about. They don't care about your kid. They care about your kid being healthy enough to keep eating so that they can keep selling their product. And, uh, and then it doesn't get taken off the shelves, but after that, they don't, they really don't care. They don't want what is absolutely best for your kid, which is only meat and none of this cheap crap that they're putting in there. So, you know, as we've, as we've been doing that, you know, autism has started going up and then you stop breastfeeding and kids start displaying autism. That's right around times people get, you know, in, um, uh, vaccinations and everything like that. So obviously people were looking around, they're trying to look for correlations and things that like, okay, what, what the hell's going on here? And, um, but then people were saying, well, you know, probably the people were getting autism at the same rate. This probably isn't actually increasing at all. Um, and, uh, you know, so they just, they just chalk that up to, well, it's probably, uh, that autism was always there. Crohn's was already always there, you know, people having, you know, bloody diarrhea 30 times a day. They just didn't notice it, you know, and, uh, and we just didn't, we, we didn't track it, you know, because like, 
you know, it was just, it was just archaic. It was, you know, you know, prehistoric before 1986 and just no one was keeping, you know, legible records and like, you know, computers didn't exist. And if they don't have an iPhone, I mean, what, what, how are they going to keep, keep track of things? Right. Um, that's insane. And, and it's, it's just completely ignorant because if you actually look at the Census Bureau, if you look at the USDA, if you look at all these uh, different government bodies and, and uh, professional academic bodies, the, the stats they kept were astoundingly accurate and detailed. You, know, you look at just heart disease prevalence and, and death rates going back throughout the, the 1900s, because before that it didn't exist, it was so detailed. You had exact numbers in America, in across America, by men, women, white, uh, African American, but not just white, like Italian white, you know, UK, French, all these sorts of different descents, right? And then not only throughout the country, but in each individual state and the 50 major cities around the US, right? Extraordinarily detailed for every single year going back a hundred years, right? Extremely, and not just for heart disease, for all the major infectious disease, all the major killers, all the major things that people died from or got infected with and all these sorts of things. They had so much detail, so such great records were kept and such great information was kept. So that's not true. That is simply just not true. That is just being ignorant of the available facts that anyone can look up. They are available to everyone. And you also know that that's nonsense. Even if that were tr the case, that we just didn't have records before 1986, and ah, I was probably always there. Well, we did have records in the 90s and after that. And every successive decade, these issues have gotten worse every decade. Autism has gotten worse. Alzheimer's has gotten worse. Dementia has gotten worse. Parkinson's rates have gotten worse. Heart disease rates have gotten worse. Now, heart, heart disease deaths, cardiovascular-related deaths like myocardial infarction and stroke have gone down. But we've also cut down smoking significantly, and we've also dramatically improved our um, interventions, like bypass surgery, like stenting. Um, we can recognize angina, you know, more quickly. We put someone on a treadmill, see like, oh, there might be a problem there. You go in there, you see there's a blockage. You blew an angioplasty, you put in a stent, put them on aspirin, and they're fine. Their 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 risk of heart attack has been significantly reduced. And so they have heart disease, but they aren't having heart attacks. And if they're heart, having heart attacks, they're surviving them more as opposed to, you know, dying and succumbing uh, from them in the first couple of years uh, more often. So that's, uh, you know, that's misleading, but the prevalence and incidence is going up, still going up and it's going up faster than the rate of growth in the population. So it's, it's outgrowing our population. So I believe it was between 2000 and 2020, the population of the world grew about 50 or 45%. And the incidence of uh, heart disease went up 55%, right? So it's outstripping uh, the, the growth in population, right? Now you can play around with demographics and do we have like a, just a body of people that, you know, the baby boomers just getting up into a certain age. Is that what's going on? Yeah, maybe, but you know, heart disease rates are going up and people are getting them at younger and younger and younger ages. Right. And so, you know, it's, um, you know, it's, uh, it's not great. And, and, you know, other things as well, you know, epilepsy, uh, we've been treating that for a hundred years with the ketogenic diet. That was, that was what the ketogenic diet was first put in place for, uh, from a medical management side of things was to treat epilepsy. And, um, and it's actually still used at Johns Hopkins and other major institutions. Right. And it works. And uh, it's just in the too hard box, you know, for most neurologists, because it's just like, well, that's just how people are taught. I said, well, you know, it's, it's easy. Just, just give them a drug or whatever. They're, they don't even teach in medical school that, that ketogenic diets can actually improve epilepsy, right? Well, maybe some they do, they, 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 I didn't hear about it anyway. I had to learn that on my own and, you know, and, and, you know, people with the rise of pharmacology, it was just like, you know, ketogenic diet, don't look into that, you know, you know, pharmacology is the, you know, the wave of the future, this stuff takes care of it. Just don't worry about it. You know, you have to counsel someone on diet. It's really hard and restrictive and, you know, difficult to get, get them off carbohydrates. Just give them a pill. It's easier. It's fine. Okay. Well, that's lazy. That's lazy medicine. And it's not the right thing for the patient. You know, you're giving them medications that are extremely harsh and can have a lot of side effects and don't necessarily 
you know, alleviate all the, all the problems and, uh, but a ketogenic diet could, and it could help them or at least significantly reduce their, their seizure threshold and, uh, and make it so they, they're getting less and less seizures and maybe they need less medication. Maybe they don't need any medication at all. And why wouldn't you at least try that? Why wouldn't you start with that? I think that's, that's the only responsible thing to do as a clinician is to try the thing that has a natural intervention that will improve their health anyway, and, uh, and, and could help them alleviate their seizures, which can kill you. Um, you start them on that right away. And if you can, and if they can't do it, or if it's not enough, you have medications like that's, that's there, that's available. But why wouldn't you, why wouldn't you at least try that and use that because it works, it actually works. So all of these issues are getting worse and, uh, neurological issues are, are, are no, are, are no exception to that. I mean, you know, in, in sort of, you know, um, adjacent, I mean, it affects your central nervous system, which is, um, multiple sclerosis, but it's, you know, technically an autoimmune issue, but your body's attacking your, uh, your axons and demyelinating them and it can cause paralysis. It can cause death. It can cause, you know, serious pain problems and, um, you know, very, very serious issues. There are more and more and more people with MS and every other autoimmune issue that are just stopping eating the you know, plants in general and just eating more healthy meat and fat and their autoimmune issues are going away. I just you know published a, a, a interview today I had with a lady. She's a, she's a PhD, does uh, biostatistics and um, her name is Sarah. She sort of wanted to stay anonymous for you know, professional reasons and want this to sort of interact. And she had MS and she had, she was in her thirties and she had such serious MS that she was wheelchair bound. She was crippled and, you know, really couldn't function. And within, I think it was around six months on a carnivore diet and taking, you know, high dose vitamin D, she is not only out of the wheelchair and walking, she's back doing ballet again. Right. So that's a big, big, big step up functionally. But what about on her MRI? What about objectively? Well, her lesions on her uh, MRI are actually resolving. So this is not just her symptomatically feeling better and, and just, you know, just not being lazy anymore and just getting out of the chair. No, her, her lesions are actually imp improving objectively on MRI, right? So, you know, you can say all you want, you can call it anecdotal and it is, but you can't argue with results. Though she's actually getting results. She's actually clinically uh, re re reversing her MS. Right. And, you know, look at the, if you look at the comments on that post, there are just dozens and dozens of people with multiple sclerosis sort of like, I did this too. I had MS for 20 years. I've been carnivore for two years. It's all, it's almost all gone now, or someone else has just been, you know, a number of years it's gone now and so many other things as well. And what people don't recognize is the, the plural of anecdote is data. And if you have anecdotes and you have data and you have thousands and thousands of people improving, it doesn't matter what your study says, because that's not what, that's not, a, that's not describe or, or a, you know, that's not a, describing the observed phenomena. And that's what a theory needs to do. Right. And if you can't, if you, if you can't even, if you don't even have a theory that's, that's, you know, able to explain what is happening in front of your face then that's, that's not a, a valid theory. And uh, as Richard Feynman said, it doesn't matter how brilliant your theory is and it doesn't matter how smart you are. If it doesn't agree with experiment, it's wrong. Okay. So people are saying, no, meat causes all these autoimmune issues and, and all these sorts of things. And it doesn't matter what you eat. Some people say that it doesn't matter what you eat. Uh, it doesn't affect cancer. It doesn't affect autoimmune issues. It doesn't affect Crohn's. I mean, what a, what a silly thing to say that, you know, what you eat cannot affect the, the serious digestive issue that you have. Um, uh, you know, but then when you have people run the experiment on themselves and they just try it out, they find the exact opposite. So, so it's wrong. That's it. <laughs> May I just add here that although type one diabetes obviously isn't a neural degenerative disease but mm -hmm. it is an autoimmune condition and they yeah. used to keep uh before insulin they used to keep type 1 diabetics alive for up to three months on a ketogenic that's right based diet but obviously it was called a starvation diet because even meat 
protein had to be restricted. So they eventually, in the absence of insulin, obviously they, they withered away, but but they, they were kept alive without insulin for up to three months. So mm -hmm. uh, I just wanted to add that there. So, um, yeah, absolutely. so does meat, meat only diet give us full nutritional profile? Because mm. people say, okay, there's no vitamin C in, or is it not sufficient? And now we know that there is some vitamin C in meat, mm. but it's not sufficient. And I don't even, when it comes to the micronutrients, I don't think there is a proper guide out there that we can all follow because it depends on what else you're eating with your meat, right? Mm -hmm. And vitamin C is one example um, because it, it actually fights with the um, uh, same um, uh, receptor as, as glucose. And so um, you won't absorb vitamin see in the absence absence of glucose um so you probably uh will need a lot more vitamin c than if you are uh, uh, eating meat only so let's talk about the nutritional profile in meat because there are a few other nutrients which aren't available in meat and would you be concerned about that uh, no. And so, so the thing is, is, depending on what you're eating, you need a different constellation of nutrients. And that's because of these nutrient blockers and disruptors and things in plants that, that strip out different nutrients from your body. And so if you're, if you're working against the, the, you know, the flow as it were against the, against the, uh, the stream, then, you know, you're, you're going to need, uh, some extra help. Right. And so, you know, like, like you say with, with vitamin C, that, that's correct. You know, if you're eating, uh, carbohydrates, that competes for binding sites with vitamin C. Vitamin C basically looks like a carbohydrate molecule with a little tail on it. And that uh, competes for binding sites on, on the GLUT4 receptor with carbohydrates. And so even when it gets in, so, so you have to eat an abundance of vitamin C to actually get in, uh, enough absorbed. And then when that's in your system, your blood sugar is high, that's again, blocking out the utilization of vitamin C as well. So it's not, it's not as well used in your body, even the little that gets in there. And then you have to ask yourself, what, what does vitamin C do? Well, it does a lot of things and, and it's, it's used in different uh, processes. We find it in our, our macrophages and, and neutrophils, uh, as well as being used to catalyze a reaction to hydrolyze proline and lysine, which are two amino acids, which are used in collagen. And if they, they're not hydrolyzed, they won't bond tightly. And you'll have these loose sort of bonds. You'll have loose connective tissue, weak connective tissue, which will start breaking down, breaking apart. You can develop atherosclerosis and you can develop, uh, you know, scurvy at the, as a, as an end result of serious, uh, vitamin C deficiency. Um, so that's not good. That's very life-threatening and that can cause disease. It can cause harm. It can cause death. But when you're eating meat, you're eating collagen and you're eating hydrolyzed proline and lysine. And so you don't actually need the vitamin C to do that. It's already, it's already done for you. So you'll, you'll make perfectly fine and adequate, strong, healthy collagen just by eating meat. You don't need vitamin C when you're eating meat. Right. And so the amount of vitamin C that you need is extremely small. You don't need it at all really to stave off scurvy because you're making, you're making collagen perfectly well without vitamin C, but there are other processes in your body that you do need vitamin C for. It can be helpful for. So, um, that, that can be accounted for from a very small amount. So if you are eating carbohydrates and you're not eating enough meat, then you need vitamin C measured in milligrams, varying amount. People can argue about what that is. But when you don't eat carbohydrates and you are eating meat, you need vitamin C measured in nanograms, which is one millionth of a milligram, right? So that is a big difference. That's a very, very big difference, right? So you need, you need a fraction of the vitamin C. And in fact, when you look at like regenerative, regeneratively raised beef, that are, you know, on, you know, field rotation and just eating grass their whole life and all that sort of stuff. They actually have enough vitamin C as per the RDAs, if you're eating carbohydrates. So there's plenty of vitamin C available and you don't even need it. Um, other nutrients, people say, well, you need these phytonutrients. Why? What do you need? Oh, you need to eat fiber. That's where the phytonutrients are. What do you need phytonutrients for? You need phytonutrients to help break down and absorb and utilize plants. Okay, well, here's a secret. If you don't eat plants, you don't need the phytonutrients to help break down and absorb and utilize plants, right? If you don't eat the poison, 
You don't need the, you don't need the antidote, right? And so, well, we can talk about this and we can talk about, well, you need this, you need this much of it. It's not in meat or it's not in plants or it's not in this, it's not in that. But again, it just comes down to functionality, right? There are people alive right now on this earth, entire civilizations, in fact, that go generation after generation only eating meat. And what do you know? They're still alive and they're still having kids and those kids are having kids and those kids are having kids and, and so on for thousands of generations, only eating meat or nearly exclusively eating meat. And up near the North Pole where the Inuit are, what plants are available for them to eat? Um, none. And if they wanted to eat meat, if they wanted to eat things besides meat, if they were more South in the thaw and the summer and things like that, maybe that's available. But even since the, um, the New England settlement in America in the, in the, in the 1500s, there were, there are accounts of people looking at the, at the, you know, native Alaskans, North Americans. And they were like, they were just absolutely shocked that they were just only eating meat. They would eat meat year round. And so they were like, look, I get it. You know, this is when Canada was, was much colder. And so there's ice was, it was just in, in inhospitable right and so you know people that in canada in canada was could not be somewhere that you could you could colonize uh so it was just a bunch of fur trappers and and the inuits right and the native, other native americans living around there and so but there were people in new england uh that were you know interacting with these people all the time and they were saying there's like look it's it's snowing nine months out of the year like fine okay you just eat meat during that time that's fine but you know for three months when the snow's gone you know, surely they could, they could live off the bounty of the land as, as they called it, which I think was funny, you know, and, uh, and they said, but they don't, they don't, for some reason, they, they still, even when they have access to plant plants, even when they could grow crops, even when they could forage for things, they don't, they still just eat meat even in the summer. Right. Okay. So you can't do that. If meat doesn't have everything you need in the proportion that you need it. Right. You can't do that generation after generation after generation, even if you're missing some things like little things uh, or, or just don't have enough of some things that only goes a few generations. And that's if you're lucky. There was a there was an experiment with um, Dr. Pottinger. It's famously called Pottinger's cats. And they did this with cats and they found that they did some surgeries on cats. They were trying to see they, they, this guy's dad had a theory that uh, to break, this was like the 1930s and 40s tuberculosis was a big deal. And um, they had this theory that maybe tuberculosis had something to do with, a, you know, adrenal insufficiency or, or adrenal problems, something like that. So they wanted to, to do an adrenalectomy on cats, expose them to TB and see how this affected them against cats that didn't have their adrenals taken out. And so they were having these cats and they were just feeding them, you know, cooked meat and things like that from the kitchen and, and just meat, not, not this, this kibble garbage that uh, we feed them now. Um, and they found that every single cat was dying, you know, when they were having their adrenals taken out, all of them, right? And they're like, okay, well, what the hell's going on? We can't get these damn things to live. So I have other vets and other surgeons go in. Me like, no, look, the you know, the surgery was fine. The surgery was perfect. There was nothing wrong with the surgery. You know, the cat just didn't make it. We don't know why. And then they people started hearing about this. They're like, oh, these guys are taking in cats, you know. So we're like, they just started turning in all the the stray cats in their neighborhoods and things like that. And so they had more cats than they really needed. And, uh, and they sort of didn't have a supply for cooked meat. It was just too much of a pain. So they just started feeding them raw meat because it was easier than cooking it for them. And all the ones that were eating cooked meat survived the surgery. None of the cook, all of the, the raw meat survived the surgery. All the cooked meat ones died, right? So they're like, whoa, okay, hold on. So then they completely switched gears and went like, okay, this is more interesting. Um, is there a difference in the nutritional content of cooked meat versus raw meat? And it, are we losing something by cooking it? And so they found that the cooked meat cats were not as, as uh, healthy and robust. Uh, the raw meat cats were extremely healthy, you know, big, strong, well-developed, you know, cheekbones and brain and, uh, and very, very active, very physically active, playing a lot sexually, um, you know, uh, you know exper expressing, you know, normal sexual uh, desires and, and procreating and having kittens and all that sort of stuff. The cooked meat cats, were less so they were less healthy they were more prone to getting sick uh they had you know lower you know litter uh, you know litters they weren't as as um, reproductively fit 
The next generation was a lot worse. The next generation was less developed. They didn't have as well-developed zygomatic arches, cheekbones. They didn't have as well-developed brains. They were smaller and their bodies were smaller. They were, you know, like 30% smaller than the other cats, right? And their bone mineral density was worse. I think it went from like 14% down to 7%, right? So they had more fractures. They were less interested in sex. They were less interested in play. They were more subdued. The third generation was even worse. These were these were, these were, these were really sad. These cats were just crippled, and their bone mineral density, their brains were even smaller. Their zygomatic arches were even less developed. Their bodies were smaller, and their bone mineral density, I think, went down to like three percent, three four percent. And they said that the the bone consistency was that of foam rubber. You know, they just they weren't strong. And so they had they had one cat that had something like over thirty fractures all throughout his body. He could just barely walk. They were crippled. It was really, really sad actually to hear about this. And then, and they couldn't reproduce at all. They couldn't make it, they couldn't make a fourth generation, right? So that's just losing out on, you know, taurine, which you lose from cooking and probably a few other sorts of things. Uh, and that was, that was it, you know, the cats require taurine and that's just, that's just, that was it. They weren't getting enough and uh, they, it just didn't work. It didn't work for them. They couldn't, they couldn't grow good cats and it, and it, it screwed up their entire physiology. And they eventually started giving that third generation uh, raw meat and their health improved and they were able to reproduce. And so like, okay, well, let's see what these kittens are like. And they, they should be back to raw meat, the raw meat variety. Raw meat stayed good every generation, right? And uh, no, unfortunately, it took four generations to breed back to what the the raw meat uh, cohort was doing, right? And so they had finally they had you know the big brain, bigger brand. cats don't have big brains, but you know, big brain for a cat, and uh, you know the the developed cheekbones and body size and mineral density in their bones and all these other sorts of things, and they weren't getting sick and they weren't having problems. Um, funny enough, too, uh, after that they looked at they had these sort of dirt patches, sandy sort of things that they were living on. Uh, and they were, you know, peeing and defecating in the sort of the sand that they were living in and or the dirt or whatever. And, uh, and they sort of left these things, you know, alone and they're sort of, you know, exposed to air and all that sort of stuff and sunlight. And, uh, and, you know, weeds started getting in, grasses started getting in, seeds started getting in. And um, in the, in the, the areas where the cats were fed raw meat, it was just just weeds just growing like crazy. There's just all these plants just growing going going nuts, and in the other ones like you know the second gen you know in the in the cooked meat cats there, there was less, and in the second gen there was even less, and like the ones there was like the third gen and there was even condensed milk and you know and and uh, and you know um, and like third gen sort of things. It was like there was nothing, nothing grew, you know. So it was it was it was quite interesting, you know, how that has an effect down, down the ecological ladder. Um, but yeah, so, you know, we know that, 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 that matters, you know? And so if we had the Inuit and they were missing out on just, you know, one amino acid or just one vitamin just wasn't quite enough. One little phytonutrient wasn't quite getting there. Uh, they would die out, right? Probably in short order. And, you know, all of our ancestors throughout the ice ages would have died out. All the native Americans that, that, Ex almost exclusively ate buffalo. Maybe they had some berries here and there, um, but a lot of them didn't, you know. And and the native Australians as well, same thing. If they had access to meat, they they ate meat. And the explorers since the 1600s were talking about this. I have a book uh, on uh, some Belgium explorers that came in. They were talking about this. There's a whole chapter on diet. They're just marveling. These guys would only eat meat. They wouldn't eat anything else. Tried giving them even fish that they had caught. And they're like, yeah, we don't want it. We want our meat. We want our muscles and abalone that we get. We don't want that crap. And um, so they're very picky on what they ate. And uh, they, and, uh, you know, uh, missionaries and things like that, that were, you know, living with the uh, aboriginals, you know, since the 16, 17 and 1800s, you know, they were, they would remark on this. They were like, we would try to give them bread and all these sorts of things. They didn't want it. They wanted nothing to do with it. They knew which plants to use medicinally and they knew which plants they, they could survive on if they had to get through a rough patch, if they couldn't get a uh, kill, but as soon as they got meat, that was it. That's what they ate. And so, you know, you can't do that generation after generation after generation, unless meat has everything that you need. And what was there to eat, you know, uh, during the ice ages besides meat, 
really, really wasn't anything. What were people eating when they were migrating across the land bridge from Asia to North America in the last uh, ice age? It's not going to be, uh, it's not going to be any fruit or tubers or leafy greens or berries because, you know, it was deep in an ice age. It was, you know, in the Arctic circle in an ice age, this was, you know, <laughs> they were, they were walking through what is now ocean because it was just completely just blocked in ice and they were eating meat, you know, they were eating seals and mammoths and whatever they were eating. Uh, it was, it was animal based. You cannot do that unless you get everything that you need. And, you know, like Pottinger's cats, you're going to get worse and you're going to get sicker and generation after generation, you're going to get smaller and, and more uh, feeble. You can't do that in an ice age. You either thrive or you die. There's no eking your way through an ice age. Nothing ekes its way through. Nothing barely makes it through an ice Everything barely makes it through an ice age. And the ones that <laughs> make it through an ice age are the ones that thrived. We did not only thrive, we dominated. We dominated every other animal on every other continent besides Antarctica. I, yeah, I don't think we were down there. And, you know, that is a testament to how healthy we were. And we're much taller too. The Native Americans in uh, the plains that were just eating buffalo, they were, they were just carnivores, right? They just ate fatty meat, buffalo, the whole year round. They would chase a, a herd of buffalo over a cliff. They'd fall, crash, and burn, and they would harvest the meat, dry it out, mix it with rendered fat, make, make uh, pemmican, right? And that's what they'd eat for the rest of the year. And maybe they'd hunt and get some fresh game here and there, but, but largely what they ate was pemmican and they were, uh, there's a study that actually showed that they were the tallest human beings on earth at that time, right? These guys were like pushing seven feet tall. They were huge. There's actually a delegation that came, uh, to meet then president, uh, Thomas Jefferson. Jefferson was like six, two, you know, he's a tall guy. Right. And he said in his in his writings that these guys were giants, that they were huge. They were massive, massive, massive people. And they have paintings of them at the time, you know, and they actually put that into proportion. They said like, oh, look at these guys. They have these tiny heads. Look at that. Psh, these idiot savages. They just have small brains. And they're like, no, no, they actually had big ass heads. And he put it in proportion. And they were like, oh, okay, okay. Not only did they have big heads, but they just had massive bodies. So they actually looked at that and they, they estimated they were nearly seven feet tall, right? And uh, just these massive, lean, strong, muscular warriors just ate a ton of beef every day. And that's, that's it. That's so, amazing. You know, if you don't get everything you need in proportion, you need it, you can't do that. I want to go back to Pottinger's cats. Uh, I actually recently uh, read a long thread someone posted about this yeah. uh, on Twitter. Obviously, what it shows um, is that, you know, cats thrived mm -hmm. on uh, species-appropriate diets because, of course, cats in the yeah. wild isn't going to uh, start fire and cook the meat, right? They're used to eating raw meat. Now, how does that translate to us humans? I really want to put your thoughts on sort of raw meat and, oh no, you're not, you can't do carnivore, you can't thrive if you're cooking your meat as humans, because we have, we have had the ability to cook meat. Uh, if you go back to our evolutionary past. So what are your thoughts on it? Because there's no way I'm eating raw meat, by the way. <laughs> yeah. I'm happy enough to have transitioned to carnivore, but there's no way I'm eating raw meat. Yeah, so uh, no, I, I don't think you have to do that. I mean, yes, you, you do lose some nutrients, but you actually make others more bioavailable, you know? And so that that could be a benefit. Um, again, it, it, you look back on what people have done. And there, there is actually quite good evidence that humans have been eating, and humans and on earlier humans have been eating cooked meat for at least 800,000 years, right? So that's 500,000 years, half a million years before Homo sapiens even existed, right? And, and, and there was evidence actually that they were using ovens back then, right? So, so using like this, this, some sort of covering and cooking here so that you had this like pizza oven sort of effect where you had this even distribution of heat uh, throughout, right? It wasn't just people just throwing bones in the fire or something like that. No, it was actually like this, this uniform heat throughout. That was 800,000 years ago, 
right? And and there's thoughts people are, are postulating that it probably goes back longer than that to like 1.5 million years or even 2 million years when the ice ages came down. And uh, Dr. Bill Schindler is a um, retired professor of paleoanthropology and archaeology at the University of Maryland. Uh, I spoke with him and he he thinks it's probably closer to 2 million years for the simple reason that when the ice sheets started coming down around 2 million years, 2 plus million years ago, you know, people weren't running away from that towards the equator. They actually ran into it and attacked into the ice age, attacked into the ice shelves because that's where, you know, presumably where the megafauna was and that's what they were hunting. And that's what they wanted. It's hard to do that when you don't have fiber, fire, as I should say, they didn't want fiber. They, uh, they wanted mammoth. And so, but if you don't have fire, it's, it's quite hard to survive an ice age. Now you can get furs and do all these sorts of things, but fire helps. Fire is great. Um, but you don't, um, you know, you, we've had, we've had cooked meat at least 800,000 years, right? So before homo sapiens existed, their ancestors, our ancestors were cooking meat. And so we're well adapted. Whatever we lose in cooked meat, uh, is accounted for, you know, because we've, we've adapted for it. You know, we've been doing it for hundreds of thousands of years. So we've adapted. And so I, I don't have too much problem with cooking meat. You know, I, I just naturally go with taste and it tastes better when it's less cooked, like medium rare or even rare. I sort of sear the outside of things now and then just eat it. I like that taste. You know, when you cook a rare steak, the inside is raw. That's what raw meat tastes like. It's actually pretty good, you know? And so, you know, I don't mind it. You know, sashimi, uh, steak tartare, um, you know, other sorts of delicacies, you know, just any, any um, you know, cured meat, that's all raw as well. I think that, that it probably gave us an advantage because when you, when you cook meat, it's going to kill the parasites, right? And, you know, when you're eating wild game, there, there are parasites, you know, and so that can help with survival as well. And so it probably gave us, I think that it probably would have given us a survival advantage uh, to cook meat as well. Dr. Tafey, we're running out of time. In fact, we have run out of time. Just one last question. Okay. I know you're busy. Sure. Um, so the carnivore diet is, is a spectrum. I look at it as a spectrum because different people identify as carnivores, but they're somewhere on that spectrum. So meat-heavy diet, dieters, for example, say they're carnivore, but they're still using spices, which is me. I'm still using mm -hmm. spices and they don't seem to bother me. So I'm fine with that. Now in the long run, maybe when I'm 80, they start bothering me. Of course, I'll eliminate them. But I've come a long way from a vegetarian diet to carnivore. So maybe I'm somewhere in that transition. So mm -hmm. so uh, what's the optimal carnivore diet then for you? I mean, what does Dr. Chafee, does it include meat, uh, organs? Organs is another one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think, I think the, I mean, optimal, if you're just going for the absolute best that you can possibly get, it would be, you know, regeneratively raised, grass fed, grass finished, um, you know, beef, uh, high fat, you know, hot, thick, yellow fat. And, um, why beef? And those, why beef? And, why beef? Oh, not red, red meat, food. red meats just seems to be more nutritionally, uh, available. Also the, the ruminant animals, they're just, they're, they're better at, at breaking down and, 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 uh, eliminating out the different plant toxins and things like that. And if they're eating what they're designed to eat, obviously they're going to be doing that better. The monogastrics, such as, uh, you know, pigs and chicken and fish, when you feed them the wrong things, they, they don't really have the ability to break things down. Well, now if those animals are all eating, you know, what they're supposed to eat, it, this is less of an issue. You know, if, if a chicken is just going around eating bugs and worms, like there, there's no, there's no problem with, with, uh, with that, you know, some people have a problem with, with egg whites and things like that. Um, certainly people with autoimmune issues tend to have more of an issue. I think most of that has to do with what the chicken's being fed. Um, but there might be something, some problem as well. And then pigs, you know, given corn and soy and all that sort of stuff. Beef seems to be better. There have been, um, you know, different accounts from, you know, like Dr. J. Salisbury, where the Salisbury state comes from. That's named after him. It's not a place name like Salisbury, England. It's named mm -hmm. after uh, Dr. J. Salisbury, who was a New York doctor in the 1800s, who did a 30-year research project into the optimal nutrition for human beings and was looking around, living with the Native Americans. They're just eating buffalo. They're living to be 115, 120 as, as spry elderly adults that were completely active and, and, you know, compass mentis and all these sorts of things. And, and, um, and that seems a bit far-fetched. Oh my God, how could they live that long? 
we know as geneticists that we are genetically designed to live 120 years on average based on the length of our telomeres. And so what that means is if you just do, do nothing wrong and just stay out of your own way and do nothing special, you should make it to 100 years, 120 years with, without doing taking any special precautions or drugs or anything like that. Your body is just designed to make it there. And so if you're not drinking or smoking or doing something stupid that breaks down your body, like spinach long before that, you know, you're not going to, you're not going to have a problem. You know, you're, you should make it to 120. And there are plenty of accounts of this happening throughout history. The Bible even said this, you know, the, the length of, you know, the lifespan of man is 120 years. It's exactly a hundred days bang on the nose. You know, thousands of years ago, what we know now as geneticists, Herodotus, the original um, uh, Greek historian chronicled an interaction between uh, an emissary from the Persian empire, empire down to uh, Ethiopia. And the king of Ethiopia asked him and said, hey, you know, what does your emperor eat and how long do your people normally live? And he explained growing wheat and making bread. And uh, they said, well, our people live around 70 years. This is 2,500 years ago. And the king of Ethiopia just sort of laughed at him and said, well, no wonder your people live such short lives if you just eat dirt all the time. You know, we don't eat any plants. We only eat boiled meat and we only drink the milk of our cattle and we would live 120 years, sometimes much longer. So exactly 120 years in all these different accounts, exactly 120 years as Salisbury saw in the 1800s and exactly 120 years as we know genetically that we should be making it to. So uh, it's not far-fetched. It's, it's bang on the money. And so, you know, he found that this is long before seed oils, long before processed sugars and refined carbs and everything like that. And, and he found that people were just eating more plants, more grains, more, less meat. We're getting diseases. Other people simply weren't. They're getting more susceptible to tuberculosis. This is something we saw with that advent of agriculture as well. We saw signs of, of, uh, tubercular infections in the spines and bones in the, the post ag, ag, uh, skeletons, right? We didn't see them before that. TB wasn't, wasn't a thing before the agricultural revolution that we could see, you know, limited samples and things like that, but we don't see them there. We see them directly after that though. And we see them forever since, right? And so Salisbury was noticing that too. He found that people that were eating more plants, more grains, they were getting TB more often. They were getting rheumatoid arthritis. They were getting gout. They were getting Crohn's. They were getting ulcerative colitis. They were not recovering from Lyme disease. They were getting all these different sorts of ailments, but the people eating a lot of meat weren't. Again, diseases of the West right? And so he found that he put people on a pure red meat and water diet. They just, these problems went away. You know, uh, people were recovering from tuberculosis. They were reversing their rheumatoid arthritis and Crohn's and gout and, and UC and, and Lyme disease a hundred years before any decent pharmacological intervention existed. He was curing these people with just natural interventions. Um, so that and he, and he said specifically that beef was the best, and this is all, it was all regeneratively raised, you know, out on the range, moving and like a you know a migrating herd throughout Texas down to California and all that sort of stuff, or wherever. And um, you know, and he said that that beef was definitely the best. Um, lamb was a distant second, and basically everything else was you know did, didn't didn't make the cut. Right. So, uh, based on that and just, um, uh, and based on, you know, what I've noticed people do better on, they seem to do better on beef, especially with, with autoimmune issues. They just do much better with red meat and water. Uh, it has, you know, generally people need to be much more strict with autoimmune issues because a, a lot of things can trigger that off. So I think that that's the best thing to do. Uh, if you can, you know, regeneratively raise grass fed and finished beef, if you can't just store bought beef is fine. That's what I eat. I eat Costco beef or I go to, you know, different sorts of places, buy it in bulk. I'm trying to get like a whole cow or a side of beef. That's just purely, you know, regeneratively raised and grass fed because that's what I prefer. And that's what makes me feel the best. Uh, it's harder to get in Australia than I thought it would be. That's what I do in America. I just buy a whole cow and I'm good for two years. And, and, uh, that hasn't happened here yet, but you know, I'll figure it out. And, um, you know, if you, if you're having a bit of spices or having some coffee or, or these little sorts of things, that's still better than almost everyone else on earth and what they're doing. So, I mean, that you're still in good shape, but I, I do find that even just a small amount of these other things can, can actually be a problem. And especially for people with autoimmune issues, um, even, even pork and chicken and, and, and dairy causes 
big problems with people with autoimmune issues. Now they'll be a lot better than if they're eating plants as well. Generally, you know, some people like, you know, Michaela Peterson, she said that actually pork is worse than if she ate a piece of fruit for her rheumatoid arthritis. So, you know, there's, there's, um, you know, some individuality there, but generally people do better on, uh, on meat in general and, and much better on red meat. And probably because they're able to, to process those, you know, that junk out of, out of, um, out of the plants that they're fed, like the grains and the soy and all that garbage out, they can get that out easier probably. But in, in general, I feel better on beef. I notice my patients do better on beef and people in general do better on beef, especially if they're trying to reverse any sorts of issues. So we, you know, we've been basically evolved to eat red meat. We've been eating ruminant animals, red meat animals for most of our existence. And that just seems to be what we do best on. Um, and, um, you know, if you're having a bit of spices on it, I think that's, that's fine. If you do well with that. Um, you know, I think that's, that's great. You know, if that helps you, you know, eat meat and you enjoy that better. And that's something that can make you do that. Totally fine with that. Uh, I would, I would say that, you know, I, even those spices can, can cause disruption. Like I notice, I, I put pepper on something or something has pepper. Like I feel a bit like, you know, fuzzy headed and like get like sniffly and I get like a, you know, runny nose and like a you know scratchy throat. It's, it's just weird. And I don't feel great for 40 minutes or an hour. It goes away. You know, but there's something going on there and it's weird. <laughs> like, a, so, so I prefer to stay away from it. And I actually prefer the taste of meat now without the spices, without the seasonings. I just really like the taste of meat. And then they put spices on him, like, get the hell away from my meat, yeah. You're ruining the flavor, you know? That's and so precisely, I think why I use the spices because yeah. I haven't eaten meat for 30 years. So it kind of yeah. covers that texture yeah. and it makes it easier for me to eat the meat because otherwise I probably would struggle. But I yeah. have come a long way, I have to say. So how about salt? Do you, you have, have salt? You, you have, and I just want to say that's fantastic <laughs> that you've done that, you know, and it's really, really good. And, um, you know, because that, that is huge, right? And obviously, you know, if, if that helps you, you know, get to where you need to go, you know, that's, that's totally fine. You may find in the future that you actually really like the taste of meat just on its own. I think salt's okay. I think salt's fine. I don't, I don't think you necessarily need it. There are certainly populations that don't really, you know, use salt, especially in the carnivorous aspect of things. You know, it, if you look back at the history of, of salt, it really came more around uh, agriculture, right? And then it was very important. It became salt sal latin for salt is uh sal and that's where salary comes from right and people were paid in salt and this way i said you know that guy's not worth his salt you know he's not worth what he's being paid right he's not doing his job and um you know so it's very very important you know salzburg this is you know a very important you know place where they would mine salt all these sorts of places um you know had cities named because they had a had a salt mine or they had you know, uh, they were by the shore and they, and they got, you know, sea salt and all these sorts of things, but, you know, uh, carnivorous tribes don't, don't necessarily need as much. And so it's, you know, some people have postulated that it's, it's, you don't need, you know, mineral salt really at all. If, if you're just eating meat only that again, you know, if you're, if you are, um, eating different things, you need different nutritional you know, a, di a different complement of nutrients, right? And so if you're, if you're in a landlocked area in the middle of an ice age, like where's the salt you're getting, right? You're not, you know, so I don't think you have to have salt if you're on a carnivore diet. Um, I've done a month or so without salt, felt perfectly fine. Uh, there wasn't, it wasn't an issue with that. There are a lot of long-term carnivores, 20, 30, 50 year carnivores that don't use salt at all. Some do, you know, but um, these are Western carnivores, obviously. Uh, you know, people living in, in, you know, America and elsewhere. But um, I think that, you know, medically, you know, salt's been demonized unfairly. I don't think it causes all these, these medical issues that uh, we attribute to it, like, you know, heart failure and, and, uh, and things like that. So um, I think it's, I think it's fine to salt to taste. And so if that's something that, that you enjoy and that adds something to it, fine. I've, I have noticed that I use less and less salt as I go. Um, I'm perfectly fine without using salt. I, I prepare and dry steaks. And, uh, so I do have this elaborate aging process that I do, uh, with steaks. And so like I wet age them, dry age them, cut them into steaks, lightly salt them, put them on a drying rack, let them dry out for another week or so, 
and they just taste amazing. You know, they, they sort of the, the, they, they dehydrate a bit, the myoglobin, you know, you know, sets into the, into the meat and, uh, and it browns much better. It, it retains its uh, flavor better. And it's just, I don't know, it's just amazing. And so I like that. And, and a bit of salt on that helps with that it helps sort of dry it out a bit, but I think it'd probably be just fine without it. And so I, I'm probably, you know, I have a bunch of steaks already done, so I'll probably go through that and then probably cut it out. But if you want to want a salt to taste, that's perfectly fine. You don't have to. I don't think if you're transitioning from carbohydrates off carbohydrates, you know, that insulin dropping down pretty quickly, that can sometimes cause electrolyte disturbances. So, you know, just listen to your body, salt to taste. If salt is just tasting really good, you probably need a little more. And just, just listen to that. Usually after a couple of weeks, uh, that just regulates and, uh, and harmonizes and, and you don't need to take in uh, extra electrolytes after that. But, you know, some people, and most people don't need to take it, honestly. Some people, some people do, do better with it. But not everyone needs it. Um, I was just going to say quickly on the, on the spice thing, you know, some people, um, you know, are more sensitive than others. Again, like the Native Americans and Native Australians, they they just haven't been around exposed to agriculture as long as others. They haven't had you know the spice trade and all that sort of stuff, which was invent, which was a whole big thing because we didn't have refrigeration. We needed to preserve and cover up the taste of rotting meat because you had to eat meat. Meat was the nutrients that you needed, right? And so you needed spices to preserve these things or to cover up the nasty taste of of rotting meat, right? You know, which is probably where curries came from, right? It's just like, you know, cover your know, curries are going to cover up any, any flavor of any, anything. Right. But, um, the native Americans, you know, they, they, they didn't have these as, as much. Right. So I had a, a lady that, that, um, I, you know, I worked with and she was a, you know, native Canadian, uh, Northern Canadian. So she would have come from, you know, Inuit background and she, you know, just traditionally, culturally mostly ate meat her whole life she had a daughter who was extremely uh food intolerant had a lot of uh you know bad reactions to any plant so they basically went carnivore well actually did go carnivore 40 years ago so they stripped out everything except meat they've been eating meat for 40 years which is very normal for someone coming from that culture and uh, even though they, you know, lived in, you know, Western style elsewhere, you know, in a house and all that sort of stuff, they, they still, they still ate in that traditional way. And uh, with, you know, wild game meat, moose and seal and things like that. And so they did that for a long time. Uh, but she used a lot of spices, you know, a lot of spices. And so she had four autoimmune issues. And you know, she didn't know she was very healthy. Otherwise, right. She was in her late fifties, probably looked about, you know, late thirties, 40 years old. So she, she was doing very well otherwise, but she had these autoimmune issues that she was getting treated for. And so she came across, you know, my, my statements that, you know, the last getting rid of the last 5% of these plants are, you know, probably gives around 95% of the benefit. Right. And I, I think that's, you know, God knows what the exact numbers are for each individual person, but I think it does make a big difference. You know, just getting those last little bits gives you a big bonus. And so for her, she was looking at that and going like, that can't be, that can't be where my autoimmune issues are coming from. I'm just using some spices and herbs and things like that. That can't be it. So she challenged herself. She went for 30 days without any of her spices. And wouldn't you know, her autoimmune issues got better. And she was like, damn it. <laughs> All right. So, uh, you know, she just stopped, cut them out at that point and month after month after month, her, her autoimmune issues, uh, got better and better and better. And, and so last I heard she was doing very well and didn't have, uh, wasn't suffering from these issues anymore. So, you know, that it, it seems like a small thing, but it, it can actually have an effect, you know, obviously depending on your, on your, um, you know, ethnic heritage, it can have, you know, more or less of an effect. So it's just something to keep in mind anyway. Dr. Chafee, this was a wonderful success story to end this conversation yeah. uh, with. So thank you so very much for your time. I really appreciate it. And I'm glad we were able to uh, to arrange this, 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 this episode. So thank you very much. You are very welcome. Thank you very much for having me.